Hey, everybody. Welcome back. I'm Stacey Bellward, the host of the Connected Families podcast. Welcome to our community. We are people committed to pursuing God's grace and truth for ourselves and then daily working to pass that grace and truth on to our children. I'm so glad that you're here today. You know, today I'm going to have a really fun conversation. I bet you there's going to be lots of laughs with Josh and Rachel Keller about how to stay connected to your kids through the teen years. We're going to talk about three ways you can rally around your teens and it's going to be fun. But first, I want you to know that in just a few weeks, we are going to be releasing two podcast episodes, bonus episodes in Spanish, everybody, Espanol. A few of our Spanish-speaking coaches gathered across continents via Zoom and recorded two episodes that explain the framework in Spanish. Okay, so stay tuned for those episodes so that you can pass them on to the Spanish speakers in your life. You know, and just a quick note, we have certified parent coaches around the globe that you could meet with. So check out our website for the full list and to find out where around the globe they are. So today, Josh and Rachel Keller are joining me. Josh and Rachel are a married duo from central Minnesota. They believe that teenagers are a wonder to behold, not a problem to be fixed. They've been married for 15 years, have three kids, one dog, a bunny, and a bird. (laughs) And after becoming Connected Families Certified Parent Coaches, they launched the Freedom Center Minnesota. We'll have a link to that in our show notes. It's a mental health practice in Wilmer, Minnesota. So welcome to the Connected Families podcast, Josh and Rachel. Thank you so much. We're so glad to be here. We are Uh so happy to be here. We love having the Connected Families Parent Coaches on the podcast. And this is your first time. So we're glad to have you. And you know, this podcast episode today is a little bit of the content that you spoke at a workshop at our Parent Summit here in Minnesota. Mm -hmm. So we're excited to share it with our greater audience. Josh, are you a youth pastor right now or were you? I was, yeah. I was for... The better part of 18, 18 years or so, and then was a care pastor. And now I'm a spiritual life director and advancement director at a Christian school in Wilmer, Minnesota. Uh, working with all the kids is where all the laughs comes from and the lighthearted. Yeah. Yes. And Rachel, you're a therapist. So you bring the brain science, don't you? Yeah. Sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> also the last I, I think yeah. right oh yeah oh yeah for sure <laughs> you love to laugh too but that's gonna be good okay I have a quick question for you guys which connected families tool is your favorite I think when we first went through our coaching with Chad it was clear that we both probably needed to s- slow down get low and listen so slow low and listen has been he, something he was that claiming has, that for you Rachel yeah I just, heard that that's just changed it's changed a lot for us (laughs) and what's so interesting is i've even had couples that i've coached that said if we would have just even had that tool maybe we maybe wouldn't have even had to go through the coaching process because that changed so much of our relationship with our kids so i'm so grateful for that tool well hey everybody just a quick heads up pay attention at the break in today's episode because we have a brand new product that's called quick guide for parenting cards That's like quick sheets for you to hear, learn about the things or remind yourself of those things like slow, low and listen. So just a big heads up. All right. Here's my first question to you, Rachel. I read your bio in the beginning of the podcast and the two of you have a big idea. And your big idea is this. Teens are not problems to fix, but wonders to behold. That quote is from somebody named Mark Ostreicher. Well, sure. Mark Ostreicher, yeah. Okay. He's the president of an organization actually called the Youth Cartel, which is funny, but it's a youth <laughs> ministry resourcing organization out of San Diego. And he is just a tremendous voice in the youth ministry world. Okay, Rachel, why is that quote just really important to you and your ministry? It's a great question. I think, you know, a lot of times when you think about teenagers, middle middle schoolers especially, you think of, oh my goodness, these awkward years, hard to connect, just a lot of problems, socially awkward, different different things, right? That it feels like a difficult time. Identity 
kids really trying to figure out who they are as people. Um, it can feel like a really confusing time, but I think when you have a mindset, these are not people with problems to be fixed, but they're in a season of life that they are really wonders to behold. Like God created this season in this time in being human for such purpose. And I think when you understand what's going on in their brain and just the real valuable time that it is, you can see them not as these awkward kids trying to figure it out, but really these wonderful beings that God created that we get to be part of this like yeah. really impactful season of their life. If you know, like we're allowed into it. So I think yeah. when we heard that both Josh and I, it just resonated with us so deeply. It's such a mind shift because Josh, the truth is that we as adults and parents, we can miss the boat. Like we just have trouble connecting sometimes with our kids. We feel like there's a big gap. Like we're almost speaking two different languages. In a sense, we are right. All the new lingo and all that <laughs> yeah. stuff. We got to keep on top of the things. It's as so parents, mid. We, That's we so try. mid, Stacey. It's so <laughs> mid. You just need to be more bussing. Like, I, know I, I mean, it, it's, we do, we live in, we live in a different era. We live in a different time frame than what we were raised in. And I remember my oldest brother was the classic overachiever. And so in his junior and senior year of high school, he took Japanese. And one of the professors who was from Japan, his parents came over to visit and he needed a place for them to stay. And so they stayed with us. The issue is, is that they didn't speak any English. And my brother, who could translate, was on construction sites every day during the summer. And so during the day, it was my dad, my mom, and myself at home with them. And my dad had this had this idea that if he just talked louder, he would be able to get through to them. He, they would be able oh, to no. understand him. And so he would just say something to them, and then they would look confused, and then he would say... No, dinner is ready. Come <laughs> into the kitchen, you know, and they would just smile and nod their heads so sweetly, having no idea what he was saying. And my mom would just laugh and look at him and say, Gary, what are you doing? Yeah. He, they can't understand you. You're not speaking their language. No matter how loud you get, it's not going to help them understand. And I, when I think about the way that we often try to relate to our kids, we just think that sometimes the louder we get, the more they'll be able to hear us. But I think if we've learned anything through the framework, sound, loudness does not equate connection. And mm -hmm. so I think what we found is that there are ways to connect uh, with our students. Most of the time, they don't like to be called kids, our, our students. And so I think this They're is going to be an exciting kids, time. Josh, I <laughs> know, our babies. I know, this is, this is going to be an exciting time today to be able to dive into some of those ways that we can connect and really rally yeah. for our kids. That's right. That's good. Yeah, you mentioned the word rally. I love that word. You used it in the workshop at that parent summit. So today we want to go into, dive into three of the ways that you taught parents how to rally. So could you talk about that word rally and, and what are the three ways and then we'll go into them? Yeah, for sure. I mean, isn't it true that even in sports, when you talk about teams that are rallying, they're going for the win. Woo. And yeah. I just feel like, don't we want to win? We want to yes. win with our, with our students. Yes. We want to win go. with them. We want to, mm -hmm. we want to take the steps needed to win in this task that we have as parents. And I think a lot of parents, a lot of parents, whether um, they are or not, I think a lot of times their perception is, is they're not winning. And mm. some of that is us just getting caught up in our own emotional mess and dysfunction. But some of it is, is just the perception that we have on how do I even win? I don't even know how to win in this. Mm. And so youth ministry background, a lot of youth ministries and churches have these terrible acronyms. I'm not an acronym person, but as I was coming together with the coming together for this content for this summit, it just felt right. And so I'm stepping into the acronym. Oh, and so okay. rally, so rally stands for remember, ask, listen, limit, and the word gift. So we'll dive into gift last. Okay. But but remember, ask, listen, limit, and gift. And so today we'll dive into a few of those just to sort of help us step into rally mode for our students. They they need it. In fact, they need us. Even a season where they act like they don't need us, they desperately need us. And it's part yeah. of who God's made us to be and the role that he's given us in their lives. Yeah. That's so good. I want to take a little 
quick, tiny little break, everybody. Hey, if this conversation is just striking you as, wow, this is good, please share it with somebody else. Send it to someone who you know could get some value out of it. And let me back up with you, Josh, one second. When you use the word win, like you feel like parents aren't winning with their kids. Can you explain that? Because I feel like maybe I have a negative connotation of that. Like I have to be the, like I have to be the boss and win. Oh, um, and yeah. I'm not sure that's how you meant. No, to use that no, word. no, 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 yeah. no. When it comes to winning, I'm talking about just winning in parenting, not winning battles. This rallying is not about winning a battle against them. In fact, if, if you've been exposed to the framework, you understand that that any problem that we face, the, the, our kid is not the problem. It's, it's what we said earlier, right? They're not a problem to be fixed, but a wonder to behold. Any problem that we face, we face together, moving at it together. And when it comes to winning in parenting, that just means accomplishing what it is that God has set out for us and our responsibility to help shepherd our kids towards the heart of Jesus. And so that's what winning, for me, winning is successfully stepping into who God's made us to be as parents. And none of us have done this before. So for the most part, we really don't even know what it means to win. Because again, all of us come from dysfunction. All of our families are dysfunctional to one degree or another. And so we come from dysfunctionality, is that a word? But we come from that. And (laughs) we are now trying to capitalize on what was great that we experienced in our childhood and build some new roads towards success in parenting. And so winning is not about winning a battle or a game against one another, against our kids. It's about stepping into who God's made us to be and what he's called us to do as parents. It's really good. Okay, we're going to dive into those three. But first, we're going to go to a break. And when we come back, we're going to start with remember. And I just can't wait for the rest of this conversation. Do you love yourself a good cheat sheet? (laughs) Or have you ever purchased a short form book? You know, the very abbreviated version of the longer nonfiction book. Well, I confess, I am a huge fan of reading and books. I've got a bunch of them, but I have purchased a short form book before. (laughs) Well, if you do like that kind of thing, I think you're going to love the new product that our team put together. We put together a set of cards that gives a digestible summary of our 11 core teaching tools. It's called the Connected Families Quick Guide for Parenting. It gives simple, practical reminders of the Connected Families Toolbox. Each card is a different tool. You could keep these 11 cards in a diaper bag or your mom bag or the car side pocket or maybe even on your kitchen window (laughs) sill. Okay, you get it. And you might need more than one, right? They're less than $10. Tap through to the show notes. You can find them. But these cards are really handy when you need reminders about the gifts gone awry or do-overs, the ABCs of affirmation or restorative consequences, there's more. You know, the quick guide will help you to remember what you learned in our online courses on this podcast or maybe in your coaching sessions. They're designed super cute and readable so you can glance through and remember the points and how to use that tool when you need it. I love that. We're really glad that you are a part of our community and we hope that the Connected Families Quick Guide for Parenting Cards will be useful to better equip you to lead your family with grace. The Quick Guide for Parenting Cards are on our website, connectedfamilies.org, or you could just tap through to the show notes right now to get your set of cards. All right, we're back from the break and we're going to dive into three of the points of the acronym RALLY. And the first one is REMEMBER. So Josh, why is it so crucial to be in a place of remembering when it comes to our kids? And I can't wait, Rachel, you're going to start interjecting some of the brain science and other things. So feel free to feel free to jump in when you want to. The reason why I think it's so crucial to remember is because it's so difficult for us to actually remember what it was like to be 12, 13, 15, 18 years old. And it's so easy to forget in the midst of conflict and challenge who our kids are, why we love them, 
where they're at in their process and what they need in this season from us. And so I just think stepping into that place of slowing down and remembering gives us perspective as to where we take our next steps in that moment in parenting. And I think Rachel can really help us in that. What do we need to remember about the process location of our kids and who they are at this stage in the game? Okay. I am so excited to talk about the teenage brain. It is fascinating. So I know you guys are listening, so this might feel a little challenging, but some people are auditory listeners, other people, you know, more tactile. So I'm going to do a little bit of snapping. So if you can like our bodies crave rhythm, rhythm regulates our body. So if you think about just a steady beat like this, as I'm talking, there's part of our kids' brain that is currently developed. It's functioning at a rapid rate and that is their emotions. So they're, you know, they're, they're angry, they're joyful, they're happy, they're sad. Their emotions are regulating at a normal rapid pace. The other part of their brain that's that is already developed is their reward center of their brain. So that like you think about the things that make you feel good. Sometimes it's a dopamine hit of, you know, adrenaline or it could be running. It could be like chocolate cake. It could be you get a smile from somebody and you're like, oh, or somebody affirms you in some way. And that just feels so good. So we all have kind of a motivation about why we do things. Right. So that's like the reward center of our brain. So for teenagers or kids, usually 10 to 24 is like an adolescent. That's kind of the age range we're talking about. So 10 to 24, they're that part of their brain emotion and the reward center of the brain is functioning at a rapid pace like this. Okay. The part of their brain that is currently developing, which is not developed yet is the prefrontal cortex. And that is the part of the brain that manages decision-making impulse, you know, the quote of like, you're smart, but not wise, that deep wisdom. It comes from a part of the brain that is not connecting as fast as the others. So when we're thinking about sitting with our kids and a lot of times they make decisions and you think, why on earth did you do that? Most of the time it is because they had a feeling or emotion and there was a reward maybe connected to that, that led their decision. Their brain wasn't able to connect the reasoning, maybe why that would be a good idea or not a good idea. You know, they have a heartbreak and they, you know, are overwhelmed with sadness and grief. Why? Because their feelings you know, they're leading and they don't have the capability to think I'm 12. I'm likely not going to marry the person that I was, you know, dating. (laughs) For us as parents, we can think good grief, but understanding their brain development. And like, this is where they're at in this season where again, the reward and the emotion quick. So that's that quick snap and the slower snap. I don't know if you can hear the difference. So we, not really, not so well, <laughs> but what we're picturing is Rachel has one hand snapping quicker and one hand snapping slower. I don't yeah. know how you do that rhythmically, Rachel, <laughs> but I, I get it. And my question then is how does this help a parent on a daily basis, you know, remember yeah. and then work with their kids, their teenagers. Yeah. Yeah. So I think it's just, again, it's that slowing down, recognizing yeah. that the emotion is there. The reward is there, but trying to see beyond that. And we have to sit with our kids to create a space for them to build wisdom in their, like for themselves. So if we're going to sit down with our kid and we're just going to tell them what they need to do, they're learning how to be an obedient child. They're not gaining wisdom in their own life experience for your child to think about, you know, what the consequence of their behavior might be or what the reward of their behavior might be sitting with them and processing with them, not getting frustrated that they're not choosing the right thing every time or choosing the wise thing every time. Or can't you see this as a terrible decision? Like, honestly, they couldn't in the moment. It felt fun. They didn't know that that was a terrible decision. It takes their brain a while to connect that. So we want to try to not create shame in our kids, but we want to give them a space where we want to hold space for their brain to be able to grow in wisdom and process, understanding that that is where God, like that's how God created them in this season of their life. Yeah. And one other thing I'll just touch on here is about two years before the onset of puberty, kids, part of their brain gets just dumped with all of this capability and just opportunity for growth. So this happens in this season of life and research says that this is the the optimal time for learning in your whole, in the lifetime of a person, the most optimal time for learning starts two years about before puberty. And then when puberty hits, 
our brain starts just deciding what it wants to keep and the beliefs it wants to continue believing are true. And then the rest, it starts pruning off because we can't hold all of that for our whole lives. So I feel like that also in thinking about our junior hires and kind of those prepubescent years where it's kind of awkward and kids a lot of times get really emotional. The world feels confusing. It's a, we as parents or caregivers have an incredible opportunity to start instilling in our kids beliefs that they will have about themselves and the world around them for the rest of their lives. And that doesn't mean that our brains can't change, but it's harder it's harder to change as they, as you know, like these ideas and thoughts get ingrained. So you need to slow down, be patient, remember their brain development, yep. and then the opportunity that we have in this season of their life. So good. And you mentioned in there, they're smart, but not wise. Mm -hmm. And by having this understanding of the brain science, then I can come around them and have conversations which are growing wisdom in them and not having more shaming conversations, which really leads us very well into the very next point of connection to rally, which is to listen, because in those conversations, (laughs) they are going to start with questions and listening so that our child does know that, hey, we're on your team. We're in this together. I am for you, not against you. I remember saying those words to my teenagers. I am so for you right now. <laughs> like, um, So Josh, let's talk about listen. Yeah. One of the things that I was thinking about, even as Rachel was talking there, was if we could ask every listener today what they wanted, what they needed from their parents when they were younger. All of these things would come forward. I need someone who's going to be patient with me. I needed someone who was patient. I needed someone who was going to listen. I needed someone who wasn't always going to try and give me a solution to every problem that I faced. I, I, What I needed, and if we would just stop and consider what we remember us needing, which is only a fraction of, frankly, probably of what we really needed, because we don't remember everything, I think it would, I I think it would just be so helpful to us Mm, as parents looking like what I needed. So my kid needs that too. And it's not going to be a natural tendency for me to give that to my kids. And so I have to, I have to step into that in a way that will help my kid. And one of the ways that we can do that is by listening. And I think that being an active listener is super important. That means not being preoccupied with anything, but what our kids are saying and being actively emotionally and physically and verbally engaged with them, being a verbal listener, a visual listener, an empathetic listener. Like our kids, when they bring us things that are heavy, when they bring us things that are light, they need someone who's going to be able to try and put themselves in their shoes and understand why they're feeling the way they're feeling. And really, they they need us desperately to be unfazed listeners. Because in this journey of being a parent, there are just things we're not prepared for when they say them, even though oftentimes they say them frequently. I remember in our coaching time, this whole idea of not being surprised was something yeah. that was like, oh yeah, that makes total sense. I shouldn't be surprised because this has happened like 10 times already. But every time <laughs> I just am totally shocked that they said this. What? Or they You're ruining this. the mess again? Right? And, and I'm like, every how, night. What? How, how in the world am I so phased? I'm so phased by this stuff. Yeah. And so yeah. one of the things that I suggest is getting a good friend or your spouse with you and having them tell you every possible horrible thing that your kid could ever say to you. The things that would make you cringe that your kid would say to you so that when they actually say them to you, your face is not messed up. Okay, Josh, give me one. Yeah. I hate the way you look, mom. I hate the way you look. You are embarrassing to me. You know, uh, like, how am I doing? How am I doing, Josh? I, I feel like your face was pretty good. It was pretty I know. Good. It was. <laughs> hey, you know, way to go, about, girl. How about, Josh, how about, I have been practicing. It's your I, I phrase, got, right? What do you say? You say, I snuck hey, parents, out. fix your face. Fix that's your what face. you say, Josh. That's what you teach people. I love it. I know. Like, how about your kid coming home and saying, hey, I snuck out last night. I got totally blasted drunk and I took this pill that I wasn't even sure what it was, right? This girl was at this party and she just started making out with me and I didn't know what to do. So I just did it. And man, it went, you know, I mean, what are the things, the things that, 
the things oh. that scare the crap out of you, those yeah. are the things that you need people to look at you and be like, I'm your kid. And I'm saying this to you because when and if, when and if those things happen, we've got to be okay. It's right. It's what's going on in me, right? It's that first step of the framework. Yes. What's going on in me that if I can be safe, if my kids can be have a safe place to process these things, there's going to be so much positive that's going to come out of it. Yeah, and so, I love it. So being a good listener and an unfazed listener. And um, an unfazed listener, which I just love that phrase, fix your face. I think you coined that. I know Jim and Lynn used to talk about calm face. And yeah. and this all fits into even when my kids were littler, they they told me, you look angry. Are you angry? You know, you're angry all the time. I know. I think a lot of parents have heard that. Yes. And so this is really important for parents to like hold up a mirror. What does your face look like? And what is it communicating to the kids? And I'm telling you, we can start these things at any time, but the earlier you start with that, the better. Because you're right, nice. Josh, you threw some heavy things at me. <laughs> I remember some heavy things coming home too. And to be an unfazed listener does not mean that you don't comment later, does not mean that you don't talk about the things later. Yes. It means that in the moment you're unfazed, you're, you have a calm face, which means that you're approachable. You're not going to yes. react. You're not going to, you know, fly off the handle. What in the world? That was dangerous. You're going to be calm. And then deal with it when it's the right time. That kind of is coming into the Power of Questions course and all the material that we taught there. Yeah, which I actually wrote with, with Chad Hange, a co-worker, mm. when I had teenagers. Mm. <laughs> so yes, this stuff is really good. So I love that. Fix your face is really a good one. There are plenty of times, there are plenty of times where Rachel has been like, you've got to go see your face right now because it is so... <laughs> It's just really bad, you know. Claim and... to not be angry, however. <laughs> Look at your joy face. of living with a therapist. Is that what that is, Josh? <laughs> that is definitely the joy of living with a therapist. Yes. <laughs> okay, we got to get to the last one, and I know we're yeah. coming to the end of the time of our podcast. But yeah. the third one we're going to cover is yift. Which yes. uh, did you make up that word? What no. is that word? <laughs> y i f t. You can use it in Scrabble. I encourage it. Okay. It is a real word, but it, it means to move or shift quickly and effortlessly, indicating agility and gracefulness. The mm -hmm. idea is a dart, glide, dart, glide, flow. To move or shift mm -hmm. quickly and effortlessly, indicating agility and gracefulness. And as parents, if we want to connect and keep a healthy relationship with our students, we've got to be committed to growing in the area of gift and being able to move or shift quickly or effortlessly. It's not a skill that most of us have naturally. We all need to grow in this, whether adaptability is in our top five strength finders or not. Practicing it helps us because our kids so desperately need us to be able to meet them where they're at. And and where they're at is constantly changing. It's constantly all over the place. And so our ability to be yift, moving or shifting quickly and effortlessly, it's so crucial. It's so crucial. So, so Josh, what does that look like? Can you just paint a picture in daily life? Yeah. And some of it comes in preparation, honestly, that we would that we would prepare for needing to be flexible. And some of that comes down to the idea of creating space for flexibility. And that means this whole idea that we sort of came up with called protecting the perimeter. If we can be people that protect the perimeter of our lives so that we have space, we have capacity, our ability to be adaptable is going to be greater than if we're constantly moving at a burning red hot pace all the time. And, and here's the thing, we need this for our own lives. We need to be flexible and adaptable, being able to shift quickly and effortlessly for ourselves first. Mm -hmm. And then we've got to have space to be able to do that for our kids. And so that's my two cents on it. I just think how we engage the perimeter of our lives and what we allow ourselves the space to do or not to not to do is going to crucially impact the way that we engage our kids in the way of adaptability. 
And you can imagine this playing out when you have, you have planned to do an activity with one of your kids and they come home and you're so excited to connect with them and they're grumpy and they have an attitude and I don't want to do that. And, you know, and so then you, you don't have to forego your plans, but you allow yourself to step into where your child is emotionally, right? Remembering like their emotions are leading them, their reward center, their brain is leading them. So stepping into that emotion saying, wow, you know, you're seeing super frustrated. Is everything okay? Is anything going on? Like take the opportunity to to have a conversation with your kid, to slow down, to not just push them to the thing that you have planned. I think that's that like effortlessly shifting through. It's us recognizing where our kids are at, maybe what they need and foregoing maybe some of the plans that we have to connect in order to meet our kids where they're at, you know, and then to do the thing that we maybe have planned. Yeah, no, that totally makes sense. Or I can imagine it could be something like, you know, shoveling the driveway or cleaning the kitchen. This is my agenda and my timing, you know, and can I, if, can I say, Hey, you know, in the next hour, could you get it done? You don't have to get it done right now when I want you to get it done because I'm feeling the need for this job to be done. Yes, I could feel that's that's some gift because I'm paying attention to where they're at. Yeah, that's good. And what does it look like for us to maybe even step into those things with them? Mm -hmm. It was like months ago that in my own life, I was just feeling convicted about, I'm always asking my kids to do this, but what if I did it with them versus just, well, we can be more productive if I'm doing this and they're doing that. But sometimes what they really need is they need that connection, even in doing that thing together. And so being able to have that flexibility and also the perspective, when we remember, hey, this thing is going to be here tomorrow. And me connecting with my kid is going to be so much more crucial in this moment than, than me just trying to get my things checked off my list. This conversation has been so useful. I think there's a lot of parents that are going to be able to really grab a lot of meat out of it. So I appreciate that so much. Uh, Josh and Rachel, I mean, we covered... We covered fix your face, which was right in the middle of the listen point of rally. But we covered three things, which was remember, and you brought so much great brain science into it. And then listen, which was fix your face. And then yift, the new word, everybody, that you can like write on your chalkboard. We're going to be parents who yift. That's right. Love that. And I'm swaying back and forth, everybody, if you can't see. (laughs) I want to be a parent who yips for sure. So I wonder, Josh, if you have any final words of encouragement to parents. And then, Rachel, I would love to ask you to pray us out and pray for all of the parents that are listening. Yeah, I just want to encourage you. Number one, you're not alone. The things you're facing, there are so many of us that are facing those same things. I think the only difference is that some of us have had this information longer than others. And so we've actually had time to try and put it into practice. But on the daily, we're all failing at things. We're all getting things wrong and we're all having opportunities to redo them. And so I just want to encourage you today that taking one thing from this and putting it into practice is going to help your relationships with your students in ways that maybe you couldn't have even imagined. And so may you just know that God's grace is there for you And more often than not, so is your kids' grace. They're ready and willing to extend that to you as you come to them and say, hey, I'd like to retry that. And so may we be the kind of people that step into relationship in the way that Jesus steps into it with us, extending grace and receiving grace. Good words, Josh. Rachel, would you close us in prayer? Father, I thank you so much for this time that we could be together all across the world with one heart towards you, God, just seeking your wisdom and your discernment and raising our kiddos who are in this season of life. God, that is so incredibly wonderful. I thank you for each student represented, God, and just the plans and purposes that you have for their lives. I pray that you help us as parents and guardians and aunts and uncles to just be able to see the wonder, the wonder that each kiddo holds that you help us extend grace to ourselves and grace to our kids, remembering where they're at in their development, um, remembering that you are equipping them and you are allowing trials and struggles and great joys in their life to prepare them for the calling that you have for them. So I just pray that we would be intentional 
in our relationship with you, that the wisdom that we can offer them will be from you in your unchanging wisdom. I'm in a world that is shifting and changing every day, but you don't. And so I pray that we would seek your heart for ourselves and that we could overflow um, that wisdom and into our kiddos. Help us to hold space for their processes and where they're at. I mean, just continue to encourage us, God. We thank you for the opportunity that we have to be where we are with the people that you have entrusted us with in our lives. It's in your name I pray. Amen. 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 Josh and Rachel, thanks so much for being part of our community and on the podcast today. Thank you. Yeah, we had a great time. Thanks for having us. Thanks for tuning in today, friends. Will you share this podcast with a friend? You know, I was just in Nashville last weekend with a couple of ladies from our community who told me that a friend sent them the podcast and that's how they have been receiving the encouragement for their parenting, especially because they're in the throes of heavy driving with their kids to all the places. I'm sure you know how that goes sometimes. Well, and if you have another minute, please rate and review. And thank you for that. We are a listener-supported organization. Over 50,000 parents like you listen to the podcast every month. Your individual donation makes the work to equip and encourage families possible. For more information about Connected Families, follow us on Instagram or Facebook or go to connectedfamilies.org. I will see you next time.